This video is sponsored by the Amino app. Are you someone who doesn't have enough amino in their life? And no, I'm not talking amino acids. I'm talking amino apps. Specifically, the Amino app. What's the Amino app, you say? Why? It's only a social media app that combines the best aspects of Reddit, Tumblr, and Instagram, all in one convenient place. All you have to do is find a community to join, hit join, and there you have it. You've joined. And most recently, Amino has developed stories, just like every great social media has. Stories are a great way of engaging your followers and involving them in your life. But what makes these stories better than all the rest is that they don't expire. So after watching this video and becoming thoroughly aggravated with me, check out the story I just posted on the Amino app. Big Little Lies was one of my favorite things to come out of 2017, which was already a great year for movies. I was not alone in thinking this, as the At The Time Limited series made the rounds collecting award after award, receiving so much good buzz that it inevitably decided to transcend its limited series limitations and become a full-fledged TV show. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was collecting awards as a limited series while already in pre-production for season 2, casting Meryl Streep for a new role. If you know me, then you can infer that the news of this second season had me uneasy. The first season was based on a book written by Leon Moriarty, which has no sequel, so it would be left up to TV writers and executives to concoct the completely original second season. I loved pretty much everything about the first season. Great performances all around, great characters and complex relationships, the often unexplored lifestyle of mothers to young children, especially in the relaxing Monterey setting, felt fresh along with the impeccable direction of Jean-Marc Vallée, juggling this heavy, character-driven story in a way that feels light and breathless with fast-paced editing, and a constant reminder of the story's eventual macabre conclusion, dangling it in front of us in case we ever forget it, a conclusion that seems too gruesome for a story about elementary school moms. It takes what's typically a stereotyped group of people in movies, these are all speak-to-the-manager type people, and gives them depth and serves as a very successful example of a seemingly ideal life being broken underneath this veneer of wealth and happiness. The ending certainly leaves questions unanswered, but it's a satisfying conclusion because, as Celeste so subtly puts it in season 2, The lie is the friendship. Now, I feel like releasing this video back to back with another video about a show with a perfect first season that would have worked better as a limited series both in spite of and because of its loose ends is beginning to make me sound like a broken record. But my frustrations with the continuation of Big Little Lies run deeper than those of Stranger Things. Watching the first episode, a few things stood out to me. Meryl Streep is great, the editing is jarring, and the episode is remarkably short and uneventful. For the next six weeks, I had virtually the same reaction to every episode. A few weeks into the season, some news came out regarding the season's production that was both shocking and also made a lot of sense. Because Valle was directing another HBO limited series based on a standalone book that would go on to receive much critical acclaim, he wasn't available to direct Big Little Lies Season 2, so they brought in Andrea Arnold, who has directed such indie gems as American Honey, which I hadn't seen at the time but now have and highly recommend. That's not the big news, though. What came out in an IndieWire article was that the reason showrunner David E. Kelly brought Arnold on board was because he believed he could match her directorial style to Valle's pretty easily, firm on his belief that a show should have a consistent feel throughout, as it is a single body of work. However, Arnold was not brought on board under the impression that she was supposed to match Valle's work, but rather that she had complete freedom to direct the season how she wanted. Granted, her style bears a lot of similarities to Valle's, hence the reason she was brought on board in the first place, but she was not informed of Kelly's intentions. As she started editing, Kelly began to realize that things weren't turning out how he expected, so he pulled the rug out from under Arnold, brought Valle back fresh off the set of sharp objects, and had him and his team not only recut the season, but also rewrite and reshoot some of it. Nothing about this process was organic after this point, and it shows in the final product, with sporadic flashbacks of season 1 that disrupt the flow of the story rather than successfully portraying the scatterbrained mindset of the characters, and supposedly full scenes that are butchered down into practically nothing. Look at this scene, where more time is spent setting up this conversation than actually having the conversation, and all that's said in the conversation before cutting to the next scene is a repetition of what was discussed in a previous, also remarkably short scene. In every episode for the first half of this season, there's some 30 second interaction between Ed and Nathan that goes the same way every time. Nathan tries to make amends, Ed says something snarky, Nathan blows up, 
and they're always over before they even begin. Arnold, from what I've seen of her work, strives for long scenes that may not necessarily contain a lot of events, but provide a meditative atmosphere that visually gets us in the head of her characters, and disrupting that is like slapping someone awake in the middle of their REM cycle. That said, the article also states that Arnold was never given oversight to dictate how the season was shot in the first place, so it's hard to tell as a third party what exactly the disruptions entailed. I can get behind the philosophy that a show is a single body of work and should thus have a consistent feel, but the shows that are kickstarted by established directors and maintain that feel with other directors do so because the directors are informed of the style they are meant to emulate. They typically aren't auteurs, and they're not supposed to be because they're skilled at maintaining that consistency, and that's why they're brought on board. Again, Arnold was hired because of her approach's similarities to Valle's, but she was told that this was her project to work on, and when you give that type of artist altruistic freedom, it's naturally going to veer in a different direction, and altering what could have been an organic work leads to muddling that bears no style whatsoever because more effort is spent erasing and altering than anything. Now, if Arnold were told that it was her job to emulate Valle's work, I doubt she would have taken the job in the first place, and I suspect that that's the very reason they didn't tell her. But they should have known that sneaking around like that was a bad move, both morally and artistically. Under their circumstance, the smart thing to do would have been to simply lean into season 2 bearing a somewhat different style, because homogenization pleases nobody. I mean, look at Harry Potter, which embraces having different directors and cinematographers and composers from movie to movie, and see how well that turned out. Big Little Lies is an especially interesting case, because the only other shows I can think of that have had single directors for a season and changed from season to season have been anthologies. I don't think we've really had a case where a show was meant to continue from where it left off, but through the eyes of a different filmmaker. At least not like this. But again, I don't think Kelly made the right moves. That said, I don't think this whole directorial debacle is the only reason season 2 fell flat for me but I'll get into that in a moment. What really worked about this season for me, more than anything, and this surprised me, was Meryl Streep. Not that I have doubts about Meryl Streep as an actress, we all know how great Meryl Streep is, but adding a new character that is this essential to the plot, who is created entirely by TV writers, not organically in the source material, gave me good reason to have some doubts. Fortunately, her performance and her character were hands down the best thing about this season. And that's not necessarily because of what I felt this season was lacking. I think Mary Louise is a genuinely well-realized character, even by the standards of season 1. Her calm bluntness, backhandedly touching on everyone's insecurities so casually and matter-of-factly, just describing her performance can't capture the calculated nonchalance with which she says these malicious things. And while she is shrouded in some justified denial regarding her son, her motivation, seeing Celeste in the circumstances she sees, makes perfect sense for the legal battle that ensues between them. I still think most of the characters are great. Bonnie feels more essential than ever, Renata's every line was jiffed and tweeted out, and surprisingly enough, even though he's not the most important character, I liked how they elevated Ed this season. Last season he was a nice, kind of clueless inoffensive and passive guy, and this season, with the knowledge of what's happened, he's become a lot more active and defensive, but the only way he really knows how to defend himself is with snide remarks, which makes him feel even smaller. I just think that's a good example of evolving a character in a way that feels consistent to their core. Celeste and Jane are working through a lot of trauma, and both actresses do a great job. There are a couple scenes where I didn't fully buy into Nicole Kidman's outbursts, but part of that could have been the way it's edited. And people obviously deal with trauma differently, so who am I to talk? I sort of saw season 1 as a story where Madeline is the main character, but the events have inherently more to do with Celeste and Jane. And I didn't really get a sense of Madeline as a main character this season. For one thing, she's one character who I feel lost some of her energy. Now this is because of her arc of becoming a better person, but she pretty much completed that arc back in season 1, and is only dealing with the repercussions after the fact this season, which, combined with the fact that her character becoming a better person is satisfying for her but makes for a less interesting character, only bolsters the case that the series should have stopped where it initially did. In general, I have a problem with sequels in which the entire plot revolves around the aftermath of the first story, and let me clarify what I mean. There are some great stories about Aftermath, in which we receive information after the fact and it serves as a unique narrative frame that works well with the story. That's different from the kind of thing I'm talking about. Perhaps the best work to illustrate what I mean is 13 Reasons Why. Season 1 is about the aftermath of an event, but that's not why I don't like it. I don't like it because it's full of stereotypes, contrivances, and content that hurts the very demographic it's trying to help. 
Season 2, on the other hand, has these issues, but is even worse because the events of this season are primarily a court case settling the first season, scenes with characters we don't learn much more about talking about how those events made them feel, rather than scenes with events that are supposed to make the audience feel something. That and there's some retconning, which is a byproduct of this approach, because there's seemingly no more characterization that's possible in the future. In season 1 of Big Little Lies, events happened, Madeline cheated on Ed, Perry died, and we learn about all these characters. In season 2, we just see these characters coping with that stuff, and on paper, of course that sounds like it could be interesting, but in general, it feels like stuff that was implied at the end of season 1, with characters we don't learn much more about. And there even is some retconning, albeit to a lesser extent than 13 Reasons Why. We learn that Bonnie's whole motivation in the pivotal scene in Season 1 is her mother. I appreciate them trying to give her a little more depth, but doing it by retconning those events feels unsuccessfully manipulative, because we don't get a sense of what Bonnie's going through if you go back and watch the scene, and that's because they clearly had this idea after they shot the scene, so Zoe Kravitz couldn't really give a performance with that in mind. The big conflict this season, aside from the custody battle, is the pressure to confess to killing Patrick. We see how this consumes Bonnie, we see it affecting Madeline's marriage by exacerbating the trust issues that came with her infidelity, and we of course see it complicate the custody battle. The series concludes with our five leads entering the police station, presumably to confess, but I can't help but feel like a lot of motivation is unclear in this scene, and pretty much every other arc this season, aside from Renata's, which is so removed from everything else it doesn't even really matter. Ed is tempted with revenge sex, but decides to renew their vows, even though nothing happens to him between this and this that makes him change his mind. A single conversation with Ziggy gets Jane to commit to Cory, even though he doesn't say anything she doesn't already know, and nothing else pushes her. And Bonnie learning to love her mother comes from no external force. That entire arc kind of just devolves into a spoken word piece rather than an actual interaction between the two. I'm not saying I don't buy into any of these decisions being made, but when it all happens in the characters' heads and between scenes with no externalization, it doesn't make for a very engaging story. As for their motivation to confess, I feel like it lost its steam in the back half of the season. The first half of the season actually does a great job showing the degradation of everyone's lives and the lurking presence of Detective Quinlan. Bonnie can't function properly anymore, Madeline's meetings with the other four make Ed suspicious, and Mary Louise's suspicions even threaten to give her all the power she needs over Celeste to get the children. By the end of the season, Quinlan has just disappeared, Bonnie's focus shifts to her mother, which has that disingenuous connection to the killing, but she gets catharsis independent of confessing. Ed proposes they renew their vows, letting Madeline off virtually scot-free, and Mary Louise's suspicions aren't so much as mentioned in the court hearing. If anything, the whole situation wrapped itself up really cleanly for these five. And again, while I can understand, as humans, why they would make the internal decision to confess, that decision isn't externalized and it leaves the conclusion unengaging. Jane and Renata hardly have anything to do with that situation. Jane's thread threatens to go into that, but it ends up going nowhere and not actually tying into the lie. The season is actually riddled with loose threads and ideas that are dropped, the Cory being a cop fakeout being one of them. They set up conflict with Abigail not wanting to go to college, and that's dropped after like the second episode. Having the kids find out that Perry is Ziggy's father was a really big thing that just sort of happens, and we see them occasionally trying to be a family, but I feel like that dynamic, which could have been one of the most interesting aspects of this season, goes underexplored. There's a relationship set up between Ed and Bonnie that could have been really interesting. I think instead of having Tori come out of nowhere and propose revenge sex as the tension with Ed, they should have dropped that and started to suggest something similar with Bonnie. It would have been a lot more effective, especially since Ed doesn't end up doing it anyway, so they wouldn't have to have these characters do anything. They already set it up so it wouldn't have required any more legwork, Bonnie already comes to the conclusion that she doesn't love Nathan, and it would have fueled the tension between all four characters. Ed and Nathan, between Ed and Madeline, between Madeline and Bonnie, it would have given Madeline and Nathan a more complex relationship, and it would have made the whole character dynamic feel a lot tighter. This threat feels like it comes out of nowhere and is very loose writing. That's the thing about the first season. It feels light and loose because of the way it's directed and edited, but the writing is really tight. Do you remember the last episode of season one, where they're all in the same location and the entire episode is just juggling these different character interactions back and forth? That tightness is missing from this season. The only scene where everyone is in the same location is this party scene, and all that really becomes of it are the same separate threads that have been happening separately the whole season and could have continued to happen separately. Of course, Arnold's style is loose anyway, but I'm just talking about the script here, and when they take the reins from a director who specializes in the loose and ethereal, 
it feels like every decision is counterintuitive. Now, I don't know if that, for instance, was something that was originally intended to be a big focus of the season with Arnold directing. I can totally see that being how the conflict was originally intended, because these scenes occur so in a vacuum that they could have very easily been part of the rewrites and reshoots, for whatever reason they would choose to do that. Again, Arnold was hired to direct. What changes she made to the script presumably had more to do with the micro, scene-to-scene -scene character moments and whatnot versus the macro, overarching threads, so it's hard to say that taking the reins from her was the only thing that caused this season to falter. I think a lot about this story was fundamentally doomed from the moment a second season was announced, but I can still see aspects of this season that could have been great, and I can see them actively being dropped, and perhaps that's because it bit off more threads than it could chew, but they stand out so much it seems like they could easily be combed out with even one more draft. That said, this show is a product by a corporation that knows it will get mass consumption, so a lot of people have their hands in the pot. And that's generally even more so the case with TV than with movies, because movies are more disposable. TV shows, particularly follow-up seasons of something popular, have a lot more at stake. And even though there are specific people with authority who have done specific things, it's hard to blame any one person for something like this happening. Arnold directed the season, but Valle took over and made the changes, but he was supervised by Kelly, who was working with all these people as executives, and backtracking like this reaches a point where it feels like the Grapes of Wrath, that everyone reports to someone higher up until the entity becomes an inanimate monster that's easier to assign faceless blame to than taking accountability. Do I blame Richard Plepler, CEO of HBO, or is it superfluous to even assign blame in the first place? What we have on our hands is a season of TV that had to pass through too many filters, and all we can really do is learn from it and try to do better in the future. Now I hate to end this video on a downer, so go head over to the Amino app where I have a new story about all my favorite movies starring the Big Little Lies cast. Links are in the descriptions and comments.